Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Cloud Based Mayhem. Got a great show for you today with Benny Kalin, uh, Swiss instructor, big time into uh, kite foiling, kite surfing, uh, base jumping, paragliding, speed flying. Started off speed flying, so we talk quite a bit about speed flying and speed riding. We talk about his uh, crazy incident last year that all ended really well in the Volus uh, with his dad. Uh, super wild and you can check that out in the show notes pictures of that incident um, talk about coming back from fear injuries like we did with Nick Hawks uh, from that incident which went really well he didn't have any physical injuries but he's having really a kind of a hard time getting back on the horse so we talk about what he's doing for that and talk about some of his uh, most memorable flights like top landing Mont Blanc which I remember from a few years ago when all those people did it on that same day just amazing uh, what well, must have been an amazing experience. So, uh, great dude, super fun. He lives in Interlochen, one of the meccas for our sport, and uh, a lot of terrific advice here that I think you're going to love. Uh, just a reminder that we've, uh, we're have we working with some friends of ours at Truck Gloves. They're not a sponsor, but this is just something we're doing for our listeners. Uh, these are a couple guys that broke off from Black Diamond uh, a little while ago, and they're making these really cool gloves uh, that, that a friend of mine, Evan Bouchier, was... Uh, selling at the rat race a few weeks ago down in Oregon and uh, they're super cool and if you go to truckgloves.com and then uh, put in the promo code cloudbase mayhem two separate words you'll get 10% off on those so check those out and uh, yeah let's get into it without further delay please enjoy this conversation with Benny Kalen Bernie, welcome to the Cloud Based Mayhem. Uh, so excited to talk to you. I've just spent an, an inordinate amount of time actually on your Facebook page. I'm not much of a Facebooker, but um, really cool videos. And uh, I didn't realize you were such a speed pilot. You obviously do a lot of speed flying and uh, a ton of instructing and foiling and kite surfing. And you know, you and I, you, you look my, like my younger brother, my much younger brother actually. But yeah, uh, I, I I thought maybe a great place for us to start would would be if you could just tell a story of your most magnificent flying memory it can be uh it doesn't even have to be yours personally but just the 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 coolest thing that comes up when you think of flying because it looks like flying is definitely your passion yeah hi gavin um thanks for calling uh, can you uh call me benny that's how all my friends call me benny okay you got it you yeah. will we'll do I think I was calling you Bernie. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my proper name, but no one calls me Bernie. Okay. Uh, Benny. <laughs> That's a good start. We'll start there. <laughs> yeah. So first question, uh, the best thing I've experienced. Um, back in the days, I was really into speed flying, but um, it definitely turned more towards the paragliding now. And the two of Best experience I've had is once is top landing on Moblo wow. back a few years with the big party. I was one of them there. Wow, very cool. That was famous all around the world. There was more than like yeah, 50 exactly. of you up there, wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And we just stayed up till until everybody else left. And we kept on soaring. For some reason, there was no wind that day in the altitude, you know, no meteor wind. But there was a constant updraft on, on the top, on the summit, and you could soar it up there like doing the pilar. You know, it was absolutely wow. constant. And we did some wing overs and ground spirals on the glacier. And yeah, yeah. just had our fun there. But we kind of starved and got really thirsty and cold and a headache. So we just had to get down at some point. Oh, what a magnificent day. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, yeah, we were, the rest of the paragliding world was very envious of that day. <laughs> yeah, Special I'm sure time. they were. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the best things. And the other best thing I've just done this winter was uh, just a soaring flight um, up from Jungfraujoch and then soaring up on the three big famous mountains here in Interlaken, the Eigermönch and Jungfrau. Um, I st- did you do that around. from the interlocking side? No, no, no. I took the train up to Jungfraujoch, okay. three and a half thousand meters. So took off, takeoff was on three and a half thousand, and then I soared up to four thousand two hundred. And that was on a cold winter day in the evening light. You know, the sun was about about to go down, and then during sunset, I was still soaring up on four thousand meter. 
it was full moon that day and it was just um yeah very clear sky and i just kept on soaring because it was so amazing um i wasn't ready for it i didn't plan really for it so i wasn't dressed very much i was cold shivering every now and then but i just had to keep on going it was just so amazing wow. so i just kept on soaring uh, up on 4000 meter try to soar as far as i could and it, meantime it got dark and i just kept on soaring and then i was still soaring uh, in the night it was completely dark uh, but it was wow. full moon and i was still soaring at 4000 meters plus that was also just um one of the best experiences I've ever was that, had on a paraglider. Was that just a really long glass off? Uh, or was that more, you just had the right kind of laminar, almost like a laminar coastal breeze coming up through the mountains? Were you, were you just soaring on like a ridge soaring? Or was it more the, just the, the latent heat from the valley of the day? Not a, no, no heat at all, no thermos at all. It was winter. In winter, the sun is very low here. It was just rich soaring, you know, but wow. basically rich soaring and the Big mountains, you know. Jeez, that um, must have been incredible. Yeah. One one yeah. of the, one of my most memorable flights when I was a very new pilot, uh, very good friend of mine, Bruce, who who was my supporter in the last couple of X Alps. We uh, is it the Shilthorn, the 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 James Bond? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, we we took that up to the top and launched in the morning and and flew back to Interlaken. And it wasn't, you know, it's it's like forty k, it's nothing. It, yeah, but it was ah, uh, uh -huh. oh, you know, just early in the morning, and you know that launch is kind of. I mean, by now, I don't think it would be scary anymore, but back then it was really committing, you know, because you're running down yeah. the scree field and then it gets really <laughs> steep and wow, it was just, exactly. uh, just amazing. Yeah. It's an, it's an incredible part of the world. And and then do you, are you there, um, is, 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 did you grow up in Interlaken? Are you there to instruct or to do tandems or all of the above? All of it. I okay. grew up here. Um, my dad, he's a pilot. He's paragliding since 20 years and. That's how I got into it. Um, I probably wouldn't have started so young otherwise. Yeah. And I'm working at the chill out school for about 13 years, instructing for about nine, 10 years now. Doing a bit of tandems as well, just to have a bit of a change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've traveled a few places in the world, but mostly for surfing and kite surfing. But I always love coming back here. It's, it's a magical place that interlocks and then the area. Well, a very dear friend of mine is uh, Whaley Kestenholtz. He, he, I know he lives there as well, but he was on our boat in, in Indonesia a few years back when he was filming uh, Play Gravity 2. And uh, he spent some time with us there. We did a bunch of towing and towed him right off the bow of the boat. And, and uh, it was, it was <laughs> that was pretty special. But it, you guys must run in the same circles. Yeah, sure. We're friends. Uh, we know each other. Yeah, Whaley's a good good dude. Tell me about foiling and kite surfing and that tie-in. And obviously, you do I, I, from your Facebook page, it, you do a lot of surfing as well. Um, how does that lend and tie into your your flying? Well, I've um, I've started kite surfing at the same time I did paragliding, um, and I was windsurfing already as a kid because my dad he's a passionate windsurfer, and somehow um, I just tried that foiling one day and it. It got me hooked like many other guys. And we have the great thing here to have two lakes. And we have nearly every day a bit wind, but never really enough for normal kite surfing gear. But with the foiling, um, you can nearly kite every day here if you have time and you can arrange that uh, to go at that time of the day, huh. which is which is very special to kite at home for me. And and does it do you do you like one more than the other or do you like them all the same? The kite surfing or the no sports? flying kite surfing because I you know I I ran a still do run a kite surfing business but I, you know and some of my best days forever for sure in my life have been kiting waves but uh, it it never really grabbed me like paragliding did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I like having a change. I think. Um... Anything except surfing perfect unspoiled waves or powder would become boring for me. These two things I can't imagine ever to be, right. to be boring. <laughs> um, but apart from that, I like, I like doing different things. Uh, 
You mentioned your dad, uh, uh, Chris Banford, a friend of yours, uh, who recommended that I get you on the show and, and, uh, sent me an article, I think in one of the Swiss magazines, um, you had quite an episode with your dad last year. I, I couldn't believe the picture. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 happened there? We talked about that a little bit before we started recording, but uh, I'd love you to 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 talk about that <laughs> that uh, quite scary incident. Yeah, yeah, totally. That was the first time I had to use my reserve. Um, um, I convinced my dad to go uh, for a cross country flight with me uh, to Wallis. Um, he never wanted to go to valleys because he heard a lot of uh, bad stories about it. Thermals are stronger there, valley winds are stronger, so but you can fly bigger distances more easily, you know. Um, and the mountains are bigger. It's just a very special place for flying. Mm. So I convinced him to come there with me for the first time, and um, I was just feeling way too confident that day. I was flying a Sigma ten um, after doing very long flights, some of the longest flights I've done uh, in my life with the Sigma 10. And then I switched to um, Omega and I've already done a lot of flights on the Omega in the past. So for some reason that day, I just felt like on the, on the Sigma, hey, that's a beginner wing for me, you know, um, there's nothing that can happen to me with that Sigma. So I just took it too easy and I just didn't active fly enough. And, and falling out of a thermal got a big 90% collapse. Um, and I put my weight to the wrong side. So you, I didn't so you, went, it at all. you went against it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't I didn't go with it. I, I, I lent to the open side and that got me twisted right away. Mm. Um, it was also the moment I was just trying to get back into the thermal. My harness had a bit of a swing. I had a lot of brake on. And so it, it twisted me and because I didn't react very quickly, I didn't release the brake. If you have a 90% collapse, the 10% left flying is going to stall instantly if you're not going to let up the brake there from a deep thermaling position. So I found myself twisted in a full stall and I just couldn't control that. So I had to give up after a, a while hoping that the glad is going to fix itself and I needed my reserve, um, which isn't a big deal, but the place I were, it was. So I, I was flying above 3000 meter in high alpine terrain and that beamer, I, I didn't have time anymore to steer it uh, or even to take my wing in. So it, it basically put me down uh, in very steep uh, rocky terrain surrounded by even steeper cliffs and there was just no way I could walk out there. So I needed to call the rescue uh, to get me out there by chopper. I was lucky I didn't hurt myself. Um, I got a bruise on my hand and my wrist, but that's all I had. Um, yeah, but definitely a, a scary experience. And then my dad, he was, he was flying right next to me and he Oof. had to watch it all. <laughs> Oof. Terrifying. Yeah. So, I'm not sure if he's ever going to come with me to Valleys. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you didn't really convince him that that was the place to go. <laughs> no. Did you did you take off from Fisch or Grindelwald or where? No, we went to Zermatt. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was something special. Yeah, Zermatt is really special. Um, yeah. That picture, we'll put that picture up. For those of you listening, we'll put that picture up in the in the show notes because it is <laughs> it's unbelievable. You look like an ant on the side of a glacier mountain. It's just... <laughs> It's quite spooky. Yeah. yeah, it was it's definitely one of those places you don't want to throw your reserve. No, and, and I and I don't blame you for calling the emergency and not walking out of there. That that you oh, there's no way to walk out of there. That was some pretty yeah, steep yeah. terrain. Um That would have been stupid. Yeah. So so you can, can you just chalk that up to complacency? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I just felt overconfident. Uh, I felt invincible. Right. Yeah. Huh. Mm. And was there any kind of uh, mental? Was there any kind of when you coming back from that? Did, were you more diff, were you different in any way? Were you scared flying after that, or was it was it just kind of Jesus? That was stupid, and you got over it. No, not at all. Um, it was kind of the end of the cross country season, 
Um, I always fly a little bit there and now tandems and with students, you know, but it was kind of the end of the tandem season. So I didn't fly cross country for at least a half a year until I went to uh, beer billing this March and um, April, sorry. Yeah, I, I thought I came over it pretty well, but this year I realized I didn't. Um, and since I used that reserve, for me, having a collapse means uh, crashing, falling out of the sky, which obviously isn't the case. Um, I've trained a lot handling those collapses, um, whatever. I think I'm pretty good dealing with any kind of extreme situation on my wing. Um, but the problem is that I feel like a collapse is means a reserve now. Mm. So um, I'm not so relaxed anymore cross-country flying uh, as I've been. Anytime it gets a little rough, um, I don't hold on the speed bar anymore. I let go. I, I kind of pussy out there. And um, I just realized I have a lot more fear than than I had before. Yeah. Now, I might be confusing the names, but I, I keep a pretty close eye on, on X Contest, and I was watching, there were some really nice flights in beer this spring. Did you have some big flights there? Yeah, um, I did one, 234 or something. Yeah, I saw that. Um, mm -hmm. That's a nice flight. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. But, you know, honestly, I was just nine hours scared. <laughs> wow, interesting. Um, um, I can still do it, obviously, and I do it. I push myself to do it, but... It's not half the fun it used to be. Mm, I, well, I appreciate the honesty. Is there anything you're you're doing to change that or to help it? Um, I think I'm just gonna try to to keep on flying to mm. to push me a little bit to to keep on cross country flying and by spending enough hours in the sky, hopefully, you know, getting more joy again and having less fear. Yeah, that's that's basically my plan. Um, I think um, you know there's, there's there's a reason the crash happened. I did something wrong, and I think I need to improve something. So I also work on my you know collapses even more, just get even more confidence there. Um, yeah, try to work on my skills and uh, and uh, flight time to to compensate that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good plan. We've had we've had some really good advice in the last couple of years from some of the guests about dealing with fear because it's something we all deal deal with in this sport for sure. Uh, one of the ones I loved from Adele Haunty, she was talking about having like a, a mantra, you know, in the air, just something, you know, that's unique to you. Uh, you know, I got this yes. or, or yes, 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 bring it or, you know, something, just something. And and uh -huh. then another one I loved was uh, Nick Nainan's we talked about, he always imagines what it would look like from the ground with the Vario off, you know, so if you had, if you didn't have the Vario on, you know, cause that, the, the noise that a Vario makes is, is, can be quite disconcerting you know, nee, 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 you know that. Yes, but if you don't yes, if you don't have that nervous. on it's not that radical and then you know and it, of course if you look at a paraglider from the ground nothing looks that radical you know really and uh and so he he uses those two and then uh an another one i like that i've been using lately a lot is uh like when i notice that my shoulders come up you know like when i start sitting up you know things are getting a little tense and i and i get m and i get more tense and then i realize wow if i'm tense if something happens, I'm not going to, it's not like doing SIV. I'm not relaxed. You know, I need to relax and yeah. in case something happens, I can react better. And, uh, and Nick Cox talks about, this is a SEAL method, a, a, a Navy SEAL thing, but the, the four and four, you know, so you inhale for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, four times. It's super easy, you know, but it's, it's surprising uh -huh. how fast you're breathing when you don't realize it, you know, you're kind of like, <sighs> you know, instead of just just nice and slow, like slow it down. And, and, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's almost like, uh, one of the things we talked about in a recent show too, are, are like fear injuries. And it sounds like that's something you had. It's actually a, it's, it's a, you, you do, even though you didn't get physically hurt, you can still get hurt, you know, when you have those oh, kinds totally, of, yeah. yeah. huh? Interesting. You never had an experience like that? Um, 
I, I haven't had a, a kind of a thing where for sure I go through periods uh, where I, you know, in the 2015 X Alps before the race for about a month before um, I went through a period where I was training down in the Maritime Alps. So kind of South of Chamonix between there and Monaco. And there, there are areas down there that are just notoriously bad, uh, really, really strong valley winds and tons of power lines and not a lot of places to land. And it, it's just, it's a spooky place. It's, it's a spooky place in the race. Like even the French pilots don't typically fly much down there except on the really good days, you know? And, yeah. um, I, I just, so I was kind of scared training in that area anyway, but I, I was just, you know, there, there are times when I'm flying, when I'm paragliding, where I just feel like I've got it. And there's other times where I'm constantly thinking about my reserve. I'm constantly like checking it just to make sure. And I, I just feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous and I'm scared. And, yeah. uh, and it just, yeah. it kind of comes in waves and it, you know, it's never, it so far, knock on wood, it hasn't been debilitating, but I haven't had, um, you know, like I haven't thrown my reserve for XC. I've thrown it practicing acro, but, uh, you know, I've never uh -huh. had an incident like you did. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, but yeah, I think it would shake me up. It totally did for myself. Yeah. And I'm surprised how much it did. Yeah. 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 And I can understand everybody that, you know, gets into paragliding and has that experience at an early stage, he's going to give it up straight away. Yeah. Or he's going to. He's, he's going to go away from cross country paragliding or thermaling and just doing hike and fly or, or whatever. I can totally understand this now, you know, how, how you don't like flying thermals anymore when you had a bad experience in them. Mm. How do you, how do you compensate for that with teaching? You know, what, what do you, if, do you, have you changed your teaching, teaching methods because of that incident? Um, not the methods much, but I think what happened to me is kind of a classic thing. What would happen to people that switch to a too demanding wing for their level. Mm. And um, I'm just trying to make sure more that, you know, our ex-students, uh, they're going to stick to their wing for a while and not going to go to a to a demanding high B or C wing too quickly. And I really try to tell them, hey, this is paragliding. And if you have a bad experience, you're going to give it up. It's not like skiing. When you have an accident, you're just going to, you know, get up and you keep on skiing. It's, it's different. Mm. I think most people are not aware of that fact. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they've obviously they know they're flying. They know it can happen, but it hasn't really sunk in until it sink, until it happens. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 We have this thing that, oh, well, it's, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't even, I don't even think it's this, what most people think. Sure. There's some that think this, but I think, um, it's just a sport. It's easy to become overconfident. You know, yeah. you're sitting there. It's easy. It's not exhausting, you know? And it's a lot of time not too scary, you know. Um, for example, climbing for me is a lot more scarier. Um, yeah, me too. Paragliding, if you do it step by step the right way, it's not too scary, you know. You can obviously make it scary if you want it scary, but if you don't want it, it doesn't have to be very scary. Uh, sometimes it gets unexpectedly, but you can also, uh, by you know, by gaining more knowledge, you can cut those, avoid those um, unexpected uh, moments of scariness. Uh, you can avoid them. And then I think it's just easy to get um, uh, overconfident and, and yeah, doing something you wouldn't actually want to do otherwise, you know, take a, a risk where afterwards you got to say, hey, I was stupid. I did this, you know, but it felt good at the moment you did it. Hmm. Does your teaching, do, do you do more speed flying teaching or more paragliding teaching? Much more paragliding. Okay. Oh, much more. Okay. Because um, I, I definitely want to talk speed flying and speed riding and stuff because there's some terrific videos on your site. That's obviously something you're you're into and your family is into. Um, but before we go there, uh, I saw a couple videos, you know, the, the, our last guest, Armin Harish, uh, talked about 
with, with Skywalk talked about these new wings. I don't even know what you call them, but it sounds like you've got some experience on those and maybe just a week ago, some not so good experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think um, uh, you talk about the reflex profiles. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the future of speed flying. Um, I've started flying a uh, with, with, with those kites um, at Dune de Pilar. And I realized it's, it's amazing how they perform. Flying one of those race kites, for example, a 17 meter. Um, I've did some measurements on it. A 17 meter kite, uh, race kite, gives you a glide ratio of nine plus. Wow. And at the same time, you can speed it up to 90 kilometers an hour and probably down to glide ratio three. So it's just a 3D paraglider. Um, it, it adds what is missing on a paraglider. You can't go down on a paraglider, right? Uh, you have to spiral or you have to take in the ears, but otherwise there's, there's not many ways to go down. You can't just dive like a bird can or like a plane or a hang glider can. And those profiles, they allow us to just dive not wow. straight down, but it feels like you're going straight down. It's just another dimension. Are those kind of speeds that you can attain? Is that just is that going to make speed flying even more dangerous, or is it a, quite a stable profile? Um, I think it's quite a stable profile uh, if it's done uh, correctly. But you know, I'm not a designer; I don't have so much experience with that. Um, but I think this is definitely the future of speed flying because with speed flying, you want to profile that when you speed up the wing, it doesn't go necessarily faster only. You want it especially to go down to mm. stay along the mountain. And this is exactly what reflex does. This is why it's not working, you know, for paragliders, mm. for a uh, cross country paragliders, some paraglider manufacturers that use a tiny bit of reflex or they use the bit to make the gliders more stable but i think if you put too much on it it's going to cost a lot of um uh, it's going to cost performance mm. and obviously this is not what you want on a paraglider if you want to push the speed bar you want to go fast and not down but if you want to speed up a speed flying wing you want to go down uh it's nice if it goes a little faster but you actually want to go down and being able to change the angle of the flight and I think this is what that reflex is allowing us. If someone came to you off the street and said, "Listen, I've seen your videos, and I've I just I'm fascinated with all these all these people flying and interlocking. I really want to learn." Where would you start them? Would you? Uh, but it, given that they were their their interest was speed flying, um, they they wanted to learn how to speed fly and fly mini wings. Where, where would you start them, and what would that progression look like ideally? Mm -hmm. I would usually try to talk them out of speed flying first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just honest with them and I'm telling them, hey, speed flying, statistically seen, it's it's very dangerous. Uh, it's as dangerous as space jumping, I think. Um, at least here, you know, we've had a lot of uh, accidents here yeah. in Switzerland and also in the Alps. Um, and I've also done a lot of space jumping myself. And I really see it that way. It's uh, you can do it safely for sure, but it's just a bigger risk to get overconfident. Yeah. Um, because uh, it, it makes you feel even better than paragliding. Paragliding sometimes is scary, but speed flying, it's not. If you learn it the right way, it's never scary, um, and that's what makes it dangerous. So normally, I would try, you know, just tell those people that it's as dangerous as space jumping and then they would think about a while maybe they still want to do it and i'm happy to teach them but i would definitely tell them if they want to learn the speed flight they need to learn the paraglide uh one thing i like to say is learning how to speed fly not not knowing how to paraglide and not having the paragliding knowledge is like learning how to base jump without skydiving mm. it works people do it but is it something smart? Is it something you want to do? That's I don't great, think so. That's a great analogy. I hadn't ever thought of it that way. 
Yeah. Um, I'm sure you can learn it if you take it easy and step by step, but there's always going to be a few things you're, you're going to miss out. You know, you don't fully understand thermals if you're not a paraglider. Um, the winds and everything, the weather, um, it's just something you, or active flying as well, it's just something you're not going to learn on a speed wing, you know. These are skills you need to get on your paraglider first. There was a video you had on on your in your feed of a guy that was speed flying with his trimmers all the way out in kind of thermic conditions and had the most insanely scary blowout. I that was amazing that I was caught on film, but he he had like a complete collapse and then an eighty percent, and then he pulled it out right above the trees. <laughs> it was a small <laughs> small miracle, but um, what what kind of stuff like that? does a lot of the community maybe not or maybe they're not aware of are there what are the most common reasons for accidents what what are what are speed pilots doing that's wrong um yeah so far it's not collapses yet hmm. um i would say the first few generations of speed wings they were so stable they had big profiles you know uh, big cells uh they're very forgiving you could fly with them in any shit and collapse wasn't an issue and only the last two three years uh where wings uh came up on the market with a lot more speed and more glide that have thinner profiles and are more likely to collapse this is an issue but so far it's still not the biggest issue in speed flying i think the biggest mistakes people do the biggest accidents is still pilot errors um and this is this is taking off you know people take off on bumpy takeoffs um they fuck up launches um they fuck up landings um they misjudge landings you know they they bump in uh, swooping um they they hit something on the way down uh, like, you know, touching the tree with a wingtip or the stabby low line. Um, I think it's things like this. I wouldn't say there's a there's a classic uh, speed flying uh, accident yet. Mm. And, and all of those just being pilot error. I mean, I guess we see that in, in, in paragliding too, uh, you know, kind of an overconfidence, you know, like you said, complacency. Exactly. Yeah. That that's what it is. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. There's for sure some beginner mistakes, you know, um, where people just don't have the skills yet and they're in a too demanding area or resort, you know, landing places too small, too many obstacles, too many rocks around in their ride or whatever. And these kind of things are classic mistakes, you know, beginner, uh, fixes, uh, ob object fixation, um, but I think it's hard to say, uh, this is for sure a part of it as well, but a big part of the, or what is really dangerous to me is the complacency, the just getting overconfident. I think all others you can avoid by doing it step by step. But even if you do it step by step, there's a risk you're going to get overconfident. Mm. Uh, is there a system, because I, I know you're working in the Swiss system, which is really the, you know, the, the best, or if not one of the best in the world in terms of the, the system they take you through for paragliding in terms of the strictness and all the steps and, and hurdles you have to go over. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's what the rest of the world really tries to match. Um, is there also a system like that for mini wings now in Switzerland or is it, is it more just depends on the instructor? Uh, like, is there a certification process? Mm -hmm. So in Switzerland, it was funny when speed flying came up. Uh, it wasn't. It was kind of unregulated. So skydivers started doing it. Paragliders started doing it, but it wasn't regulated. And then, um, you know, the the Swiss um, Aviation Federation came and said, "Hey, who's gonna take care of this? Skydivers or paragliders?" You know, who wants to deal with that? And then the skydivers, they said, no, we don't know. We don't want to deal with this. So it ended up being with the paragliders, which is a great thing, I think, uh, just because it's a lot more close to paragliding than it is to skydiving, obviously. Mm. 
And um, so we have the regulation now in Switzerland that anything uh, smaller than 14 square meters, you need to have a speed flying license. To get your speed flying license, you need to pass your paragliding license and you take another course which three to five days uh, with an instructor and then he's going to sign you off. Uh, and you get that speed flying license. That's great. I love it. No, I hope we follow in those footsteps. One of the things that I have struggled with in my own, you know, kind of speed flying in, 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 in with progression is, is, uh, cause I, I'm much more passionate about paragliding, but I do a lot of speed flying in the winter and, um, but it's, it's the lack of time under the canopy. Yeah. I mean, your, your runs are so fast, you know, you I mean, you really have to get after it to get, you know, much real time and, you know, like, uh, doing barrel rolls right off the ground is obviously a super advanced maneuver, but the, the you know, these, the wings are, are so easy to fly. Um, and like you said, so stable, they encouraged me right off the bat to do things that I probably wasn't ready for, you know, like, how do you, how do you stop people from doing that? <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's like you said, I, I think it's great that you're encouraging people to paraglide first because that's where you get time and that's where you, you understand weather and you get all these, you know, the, the foundational skills to be able to speed fly, but it, it, it um, I, they are just incredibly easy wings to fly. I guess is where I'm going with that. And that, that, yeah, word, that makes, yeah. that's what makes me nervous. Yeah, totally. Uh, I totally agree. It, you know, it doesn't collapse. Um, so it's not scary. So that's, that's how you become, uh, uh, overconfident and complacent. Mm. Um, I don't know how to stop people from doing barrels on their first day speed flying. Um, when you look at YouTube uh, videos, this is all they do, you know, barrels. Um, when I started speed flying, barrels didn't exist. Hmm. I haven't ever seen somebody doing barrels. I figured out myself that this is actually possible, and I was the first guy to do them here. Um, so I didn't have that problem <laughs> that I wanted to do this the first day. You know? <laughs> um, but I can I can understand people that they look at this and it looks cool, and it's kind of the only trick you can do flying. So they all want to do it. Um, what I tell people is that. If they speed fly and they don't do cliff launch and barrel roll, it's twice as safe. Yeah, well, that's good. That's great advice. Um, I think you know, obviously cl cliff launches it's easy to kill uh, pilots and barrel rolls. Um, it's also easy to get killed or at least badly hurt. And there's a few videos online uh, from people doing barrel rolls the wrong way and fucking up big time. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy to do a barrel roll, you know, there's not much, uh, dangerous about it if you do it high and if you do it slow. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't understand about the barrel roll is you can do it slow. They're afraid of falling into the wing. They're afraid of stopping halfway, uh, in it and then just falling down into the wing. And the moment I tell people, Hey, you can do anything you want. You can't make the wing collapse by doing a barrel roll or even fall down in it. It's going to take away a lot of pressure for the people and they're going to be much more relaxed about the barrel rolls. And they start doing it slowly, you know, somewhere high over the ground. And then once they've done it, uh, you know, a dozen times, they figure out themselves how they can do it a little quicker and a little nicer and how to make it look a little better. Um, but I think it's important to understand you can't fall into the wing. Yeah, good point. Are are you teaching people to do, you know, to to do their first barrels and that kind of thing high? Uh and with are they flying with reserves too? Yeah, exactly. I, I tell them they should go out high and take a reserve when they start practicing barrels. Mm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot myself because I, I I never have. And lately I've been thinking, yeah, I should I should take a reserve. Why not? Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're close to the ground, it doesn't help you, but um, you don't want to learn a barrel roll close to the ground, right? So, um, yeah, go high, take a reserve. Where where should people start? You know, wing size, and uh, you know how how to how to kind of 
say they've gotten their kind of beginner license with paragliding and they really want to speed fly, you know, what, what, where do you start? Um, difficult question. It's all about, um, the wing load. Um, I realized a lot of people, you know, they compare themselves with others. Um, but if you're a hundred kilo or a 90 kilogram and you compare yourself with a guy that is only 60, <laughs> um, it's like comparing apple with bananas. So <laughs> you need to you need to think about wing loading. Obviously, um, we recommend people um, to, to start on skis because skis are more forgiving. Sure. Um, and they let you do a lot of flights. You know, in a ski resort, if you have chairlift, you can go up and down. You can do thirty flights a day. Uh, still short flights, but it's thirty runs. You know, you get to take off thirty times. You get to land thirty times. Um, I think this is a good way to progress in skis and plus it's forgiving if you if you fuck up launches or landings you've got the skis they take away a lot of energy mm. um, and we think wing loading wise it's it's good for the last for the first two years or for the first couple hundred flights not to go over eight kilogram per square meter okay great I hadn't heard that one before okay yeah. Um, if you go above that, you're very high loaded. And what I think as well is important is um, I would start flying a mini wing first. When I started speed flying, there was only two wings. Um, one was the chin, and you could buy it in 14, 13, 12, and 10. So 14 was the biggest sizes, and there wasn't anything between 14 and a 20 meter paraglider or even 23 meter paraglider mm. uh, but nowadays you can start with a you know a 16 meter 15 meter or a 17 meter mini wing which is a great thing if you're not very experienced paragliding yet um, or you're not a great skier and you want to learn foot launching uh, then this is a great step in between and i really recommend people take that step uh, take your time fly that mini wing for a while and then Switching for a sit from a 16 meter mini wing down to a 13 Mirage or 15 Mirage is not a huge step anymore. There was a video on your on your uh, on on Facebook that was like a, a the video was the perspective from the somebody on a mini wing uh, following on skis and the, the one of these kites the, one of the reflex kites was out in front and he was just getting these like obviously just hitting the brakes a little bit and just going, you know, hundreds of feet above the ground, just amazing. It looked like performance. Well, I, I, I couldn't really tell, um, how that was happening. Is that, is that all it is? Is just a, a matter of letting it dive and pulling it back? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, so much more performance in it than on a speed wing. That's why we're, we're flying these things. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Going back to a speed wing feels like a beginner wing. Wow. Is it, are there many companies working on this? Cause we haven't seen one of these over here, at least not that I know of. I don't think so. Uh, I only know, know from Skywalk that they're working on it, but I hope there's some other guys working on it too. <laughs> Fascinating. It's a, it's a it enticing part of the sport. I can't wait to see yeah, how that yeah. goes. Oh, totally. This is going to be, uh, amazing. I think, not only for speed flying, you know, but I think for coastal soaring. If you think about coastal soaring, you know, uh, with a paraglider, the li the window you can fly your wing on the coast is kind of limited, you know. When the wing gets a little strong, it gets really hard to launch and you're going to get dragged. Mm. Um, you know, when you pull up the wing, you get thrown in the air, um, on voluntary. Um, it's just hard to deal with a paraglider in strong winds, where with those kites, it's so much easier, uh, especially if those reflex, they don't overshoot uh, or they overshoot, but they don't collapse. And you can you can stand in probably you know, 40, 50 percent more wind than you could handle the same size paraglider when you have a reflex wing. Wow. Uh, I got it. It's hard for me to even get my head around it. I need to watch. I need to look at more of your videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's so fascinating. Um, if you'd ever fly one, you'd be totally surprised and and uh, amazed for sure. Yeah, it's 
it's the future, I think, yeah. And you talk about it being the future for speed flying, but would it be for paragliding as well? I don't think so for cross-country paragliding because it, it, it does kill performance. Um, okay. I think mini-wing flying and coastal soaring, that's where I see it. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Do you think your your background and kind of passion in, in surfing and kite surfing and foiling, do you think that really helps your flying? And if so, why? I don't think so. No. Interesting. No, it's it's a different thing. Yeah. Do you think the kite surfing helped you? I do. And I think the sailing did as well, just because it's, it's air, you know, it's still understanding. Well, so I've had this theory for a while. I've talked to some other people. I used to do a lot of paddling, a lot of whitewater paddling, kayaking and paddling and stuff. And, um, you know, I think will I did this, this traverse tr paragliding bivy trip with Will Gad, a Red Bull project a few years ago. And he's a big paddler. And we talked about that a lot that, you know, that, understanding the how water moves is is basically the same how air moves you know there's eddies and currents totally. and lee and uh like the ocean moves and and so there's there seem to be you know like kayakers seem to get paragliding really fast faster than other people and i, I think some of that is because of the movement you know it's in your hips and it's in your it's in your belly and it's all about core, but I think it's also the risk profile, you know, like kayaking is kind of similar in that you can't hit the stop button midway down the rapid, you know, just like in paragliding, you can't just be like, yeah, okay, exactly. I'm done. I want to pull over now totally. and stop, you know? Yeah. So I think that's, so part of it's, I'm sure just that mental, you know, people are drawn to that kind of risk profile, but um, I, I've often thought that, and I, I don't, I don't have any proof to back this up this is just a thought um but that the, the all the years i spent sailing and, and kite surfing and that's it's a different kind of air that's laminar it's in the ocean it's very different than what we deal with in the mountains on a paraglider so i might be just totally wrong about this but i think it did help me understand just how air moves in the mountain you know like Kriegel's magic, uh, I've said this so many times, I'm sorry, folks and li listeners, but, you know, his magic is really understanding the big picture. This is my theory is he understands the big picture of how air moves in the mountains and he's just using it better than everybody else. And, and I think, I think that just comes from an understanding of air and, and, and wind and movements and, you know, just how it moves around objects and where you can utilize that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to think the kite surfing and the sailing helped, but I don't know. It's interesting that you think it didn't. Um, it sure does help a little bit to understand it, but um, paddling for sure helps a lot, I think, because you really need to understand the water. If you don't understand the water, uh, it's going to kill you. And paragliding is very similar. If you want to go far on a wing, you need to understand the air, how it's working. Um. But um, you kind of learn it anyhow, you know. Mm. Kiting in the ocean is somewhat different and it's laminar wind than paragliding in the mountains. And I think you only learn this by doing it, by experiencing it, but at the same time reading it up or reading it up first and then experience it or the other way. But kind of you really have to work on it. You have to interest it, uh, be interesting in it and to fully understand what's going on when you think about flying when you're in bed at night and you're dreaming um you, what what gets you really excited right now about the sport like what, what do you have any projects in mind or um is it you know is it big cross-country flights or is it like travel to beer uh, that kind of stuff what, what what has you excited about the next kind of five years hmm <laughs> good question um, yeah, I hope I get my, um, my confidence back, um, cross country paragliding and I hope I enjoy it again more, uh, that I do right now, but I don't have any big dreams right now, to be honest. <laughs> if you look back at your, this is, I ask this of everybody and it's, I love it, but if you look back at your flying career uh all the way back to the beginning if you you know imagine you're you imagine you're back at your 50 hour self um tell us when that was where you were 
And if you could, you know, go back and talk to that Benny at that time, what advice would you give him? Hmm. Um, when I was a 50 hours pilot, I didn't care much about thermaling and paragliding. All I wanted to do is speed flying. <laughs> uh, the speed flying got me hooked a lot more than the paragliding did first. Um, I remember I even had a time where uh, it was a little scary, the paragliding, because um, I haven't flown much myself for a while. And, you know, you always hear about accidents. And I was like, hey, this might happen to me as well. But then I got hooked with that speed flying, and all I did is just speed flying every every single minute I could, uh, whether in winter with skis or in summer foot launching. And then um, I felt confident, and I never thought back about uh, that fear I had in paragliding. In what what year would this be? And were were you in interlocking then too? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when 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 would that when were you when were you a fifty hour pilot? How long ago? Uh, it was probably two thousand seven. Wow, quite a while. Okay, and then so advice for your fifty hour self. What would you would you have changed anything about your trajectory and what you've done? Um, yes. Um, yeah, stay more current paragliding when you speed fly. Ah, okay. <laughs> Don't put your paraglider into the basement when you start speed flying. Interesting. Keep doing both. That's really cool. So you really see that they're super integral skills. In, in other words, they, you you really need to do both to, to perform at one. For sure, yeah. For sure. But you're a much safer speed flying pilot uh, if you're a good paraglider pilot, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. I like it. Uh, any other family members in the sport other than your dad? Is he still a pretty active pilot? Um, yeah, he is. Yeah, he's just trying to get his um, – he's retired now from work, and he's now um, just trying to get his uh, tandem license. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so he's still keen, and I think he's flying more than ever as he's got time now uh, as, uh, as being retired. That is so cool. I mean, you guys are in the spot, maybe in the world for tandems. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a more busy tandem place than, than Interlock. And it's such a gorgeous place to, to do it. Yeah, totally. It's busy, but I think there's busier places like Oli Denny's. I think they do even more. Really? Gosh, I couldn't imagine. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, <laughs> I can't but imagine. It's sure. Yeah. It's for sure a great place here in the locks and, and um, I think it's also a great flight for the tourists, you know. Um, up on launch, the view is amazing. You see those three huge mountains, you can see lakes, you can see glaciers. Um, and then you go and fly over a city and you land in the middle of the city in between two lakes, which is very special too. Yeah, it's a, it's truly a unique unique place in the world. I'm I'm really hoping the X Alps goes through there again. Although when it does, then <laughs> we give Kriegel even more of an advantage. So maybe that's maybe, maybe that's a bad idea. <laughs> I've been I've been exactly. gripped watching the X Pier the last few days, and he just smoked everybody yet again. He's just a, in a totally <laughs> different league. It's it's so impressive. Yeah. So, but do you think it's a big advantage uh, when you fly in a place? Um... And you know it well for cross country flying. You know that that's a really good question. The um, the kind of going thought on that seems to be like it, it competitions. You know, so like PWCs and that kind of thing. It seems to not be an advantage. You know, the local pilots will often exactly. will often get beat because they do what they know, and and the people that come in with a fresh mind, uh, you know, have new ideas that often work better. And I think mm -hmm. you know that's. It, Interestingly, on that exact same note, Kriegel is one of the only pilots, uh, other than the ones that just don't have the time or don't have the money to to spend before the race. But he doesn't scout at all. Um, I was amazed to hear that in 2015. He and I were sitting right next to each other at a um, uh, yeah a press conference at the, one of the Red Bull hangars like a couple days before the race and. And they said, you know, what have you been doing the last few weeks? And he said, I've just been training at home. 
And, and uh, you know, and I had been going everywhere I possibly could on the course to try to learn it. And part of that's because, uh -huh. you know, the, for those of us that aren't Europeans, which is, you know, we don't know nearly as much about the Alps as the Europeans do. So I think that's important. But he says he, he, he does that, you know, really specifically because he doesn't want to go into an area with preconceived notions, you know, like – he kept hearing, yeah. you know, a great example. He, he said this on the podcast we had with him, but he he kept hearing from everybody that had scouted that getting down to the Garda turn point in the air would basically be impossible unless you came in there at a perfect time of day because the, the valley winds are so strong from the south and we were flying south. And and then he did it, you know, because he, yeah. he just – because he, he went in there with open eyes and figured it out. And uh, I mean he didn't – all the way do it but he he was the only one really that flew that and uh and so i think that's that's part of his magic you know i don't i don't know that i mean i i think i'll still go and scout in advance but <laughs> but um yeah i don't know if it's much more of an advantage i mean i i just i don't know that they can take that race anywhere that's going to disadvantage him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he's just better than everybody else by a huge margin <laughs> Yeah, it is impressive. I think it's also ha hard to have experience he has. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, cross country flying has got a lot to do with uh, experience. Yeah, and that's my Ben and I were just laughing about that yesterday. Ben's my my other supporter, uh, and we were laughing about that because it, you know the the problem is is we are all training really hard, but so is he. <laughs> So he just keeps getting <laughs> yeah. better, you know, yeah. it's not like, it's not like we're catching up or making ground, you know, he started when yeah. he was nine, exactly. I started when I was 35, that just, that doesn't compute, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm never going to catch him, that's just how it goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, I think he's, he's training a lot too and very focused, you know, like, uh, like a proper sportsman. Yeah, he's a professional, he's a professional. Yeah. For Very sure. professional training, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, uh, for all the aspects, the psychology, the the soft training, the you know everything. I think he's doing it all. Yeah, I think so. Benny, that was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, just a joy to talk to you, and I, I hope to come speed fly and paraglide with you at some point. I I am not the the speed pilot you are, but I'm sure I could learn a ton, and uh, and I think we could have fun turn circles in the sky, but. Thanks for sharing your time. This just took us weeks to put together. I'm glad. We're so glad we were finally able to pull it off. Yeah, you're welcome, Gavin. Thanks uh, for the ring. No problem. And let me know when you're in Interlock and anytime. Sounds great. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye, Gavin. Ciao. I uh, hope you enjoyed that cool talk with a cool guy who's been uh, at this this sport in all of its ramifications and iterations for an awfully long time. Uh, learned a lot there. I hope you did too. So a couple public service announcements, I guess is what you'd call them, uh, that have come up in the last few weeks uh, from the last couple shows. Uh, one was Nick Hawks. Uh, a lot of people really resonated with that one, um, having, his having those couple of close calls. And I actually got quite a few emails about his wing choice and they were pretty disappointed that I didn't call it out. Uh, he's flying the Carrera Plus, which I'm not super familiar with. Uh, I guess it's a pretty hot bee, not as hot as the Carrera. Um, but, you know, people were like, oh my God, how, you know, he shouldn't be on that kind of wing. Um, so the reason I didn't pull, pull that out is because I think it's really important that we judge people not by the numbers, by hours, but by ability, um, you know, and it's probably not fair to make a comparison to myself, but when I was probably around his same number of hours, I was over in beer in India and uh, flying the Gen Rebel, which was a C, so quite a bit hotter than what he's flying. And, you know, I was doing, that was kind of where I did my first kind of 100K flight. So, you know, at that point I had done two major SIVs and a couple little one dayers. So kind of like what Nick has done, I had been training a lot. I've been flying a ton. Um, you know, I didn't have the hours necessarily that justified that, but I kind of agree with Nick's thoughts that, you know, when you're learning late in the game and you want to get really good, you know, you're going to have to take some risks. So, uh, and it's really on that person to decide. So I agree with him there. You know, he knows the risks he's taken and, you know, maybe those two incidents are a little bit of a, 
oh man, maybe I'm not on the right wing, but that's really for him to decide. And, uh, you know, and his community to decide. And it's kind of hard for us to make these judgment calls really from a podcast or from the outside. So that's my opinion on that. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things you'll hear on this show over and over and over again is trying to talk people down from moving up on wings and staying on safe stuff. But, you know, the reality is, is, you know, if, if you're getting bored or you want more performance or you want more, um, you know, not thrill, but you, you want to move up, then, you know, this sport is risky and it's going to just, you just have to eat those risks sometimes and, and move forward. And that's how you get better as well. So, uh, I think what we're trying to say is that do it as safely as you possibly can and, uh, you know, spend the money on training before gear for sure. That's, a another common theme. Um, the other one was the, the last episode we did with Nick Grease. Um, a lot of people also really resonated with his story of, of Kenya and the PTSD and kind of all the mental stuff he went through and got a great email from a guy named Anti. I, I'm sure I'm not saying his name right. A-N-T-T-I. I will put his uh, contact details in the show notes for this one because he has offered and has done a lot of uh, uh, psychology and you know he he has uh, helped a lot of pilots he, he comes from a medical background and uh, psychology background and uh, he's helped a lot of pilots he's not doing it for the money um, but if you know if you if you've been through something like that or you're dealing with fear injuries or any kind of things he has offered to help and uh, what they're doing is just doing a donation to like the cloud bait cloud-based foundation or karma flights or something and so that's kind of his way of giving back to the community so super generous really interesting i think obviously really helpful for uh, many in this community that have had to deal with that kind of stuff and stuff that's pretty scary and so uh check out the show notes and feel free to reach out to auntie he's pretty uh psyched to receive the the emails and and try to help where he can so there you go as always, all we ask for is a buck a show. If you enjoyed the show or one of the previous ones, uh, we're stacking up a lot of hours of great content there. So go back and check it out if you haven't. Um, but if you're enjoying it, treat it like a magazine subscription or something. And uh, don't just send us a, a dollar. Wait till you listen to 20 or 30 or 40 and decide if it's worth it. And uh, you can do a one-time donation through PayPal. You'll find the links for that on cloudbasedmayhem.com. Or you can be a regular supporter of the show and you only pay when content comes out and you're rewarded for doing so on patreon.com forward slash cloud based mayhem so and there's also we've got a new store we've got some great patagonia swag uh t-shirts with the cloud based mayhem logo on the back those are all organic fair trade classic patagonia lasts forever great quality shirts uh, for men and women and we've got the annika herndon makes these killer recaps these trucker hats that are awesome i love them each one is totally unique and you can find those on there as well so many ways to do it and if you can't there's no problem with that too we will keep putting out the content uh, there's other ways to support the show you can blog about it you can share it with your friends you can share it on facebook many many different ways but uh we appreciate you listening we appreciate your support and we'll see you on the next one thank you it's a crowd,